right. So we are now on uh, session three of our um, program. Thank you guys so much for attending. I've been just amazed that everybody's stuck with me this far in. Um, wanted to uh, say a couple of things. Uh, if you are having trouble, and we know that some people have been having trouble um, getting the emails that go out that have the links to the presentation video and also to the PowerPoints and things. Um, so they may be in your spam drive. That's where I found mine, honestly, was that it had gotten to the spam drive. So you might wanna take a look there. Um, I also put in the chat a link to APSI's, uh, the videos that they're all putting online on the APSI website. And then um, uh, Amy put in the link to the presentation, today's presentation. So you should have everything for at least um, for the more recent, for the YouTube, the videos that have been done so far should be the chat from me. And the presentation materials for today should be the chat from Iowa Employment First. So all of that is on there. June did an awesome job last week uh, bringing us all in and said all the right things. And I'm going to try to emulate her as much as possible today. Um, my name is Diane Hernandez. I am she, her. Um, I did want to make sure that we thank everybody who's made this possible. So um, this is hosted by the Iowa Coalition, Coalition for uh, Integrated Employment, uh, Integration and Employment. They have um, graciously hosted all this thing and organized everything and made sure that we all are able to see each other. Um, Iowa APSI and the Brain Injury Alliance have also promoted this program and we're very thankful to them. Children and Families of Iowa keeps me employed and a place to go all day. Um, and so we are very thankful to them for keeping Diane having income. Um, if you guys have questions, I, you're it's totally fine if you unmute or put it in the chat. I'm really good with either one, um, whichever you're most comfortable with. If you put it in the chat, then at the appropriate time, somebody will tell me that you ask a question. Um, if you, I don't really care whether or not you have your cameras on or not. It's nice, but in all honesty, I can't see that many of you anyway, so I probably won't be able to notice. Um, and what else do I want to tell you guys? Um, everything's in there. Um, our, we have one more session um, with me, which is February 17th, and then you guys should come to that, but also um, on March 3rd, the Brain Injury Alliance is hosting, hosting a bonus roundtable discussion session um, where we're going to have persons served talking about their lived experience um, after getting employment after brain injury. Um, and obviously, there is nobody better to learn from than the people who have actually experienced it. So you guys should definitely, definitely check that out. Um, that said, I'm going to go with that. There aren't any other questions right now. Um, anyway. All right. So, oh, and the other thing I was going to say is I do put my email and um, phone number and all that down at the bottom of each presentation. Um, honestly, if you guys have any questions, if you didn't get something, if you want extra information about a resource or whatever, um, honestly, the part about doing this virtually that I hate the most is that I don't get to interact with people. So you will honestly make my day um, if you send me an email and ask me a question or ask for some something, because then I'll know that you were listening and that will make me very happy and you will know that you made made somebody's day, right? Um, all right. So I'm going to go back and um, we're going to be talking about um, executive function about all the different job strategies that we've been using with Bob Brainy, right? Bob Brainy is our case um, that we're working with through here. And I feel like we, we ran through a lot of that stuff really fast. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to go through and talk that through again. So with a lot of the folks that you, so we're gonna go through each one of these kind of individually. 
Um, one of the things that we work on with Bob, but also with um, a lot of clients is um, doing things, remembering to go slow. By that, I mean, go slow as far as let's not try to do, you know, not, let's not rush into full employment or too much responsibility. Like it, the better that you can break things apart and start slow and move slow and learn one task at a time, the better it will be for the person served. The slower that you can go when job coaching individual skills, the better. So in addition to this day job that I have, I'm also a yoga instructor. Um, and one of the things that when they're talking about teaching yoga, a lot of times we'll try to slow down and do a movement really slowly to integrate that into the person being able to understand how they're supposed to move their body. Um, and so I found this quote, and I can't even remember if this is for yoga or brain injury, but the slowness of movement is a key to awareness and awareness is the key to learning. So the slower the movement, slower movement leads to more subtle observation and maps differentiation so that more change is possible. So when we're trying to teach something, not that you guys don't slow down anyway, but I want you to think about it from a neurocognitive standpoint moving slow and really paying attention to where you are in space when you're doing something is going to map stronger in your brain. And actually, Bob Brainy, when he was um, opening up bars across the United States and training staff, used to tell his staff, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Um, and so then we've been in integrating that into what he's been learning at his job um, if you start trying to move too fast, that's when things get messed up. And if you move slowly, then you're, it's going to go more smoothly and going more smoothly is actually going to make it faster. And sometimes you might have to do employer education in that they're like, well, they're not moving fast enough. Like, well, let them learn it, let them learn it at a slow pace. And then they're going to be able to pick that up and move faster. But trying to move at a fast pace right from the get-go is probably not your best option. Um, you're obviously going to be dealing with um, executive function. That's a big part of what can go wrong with brain injury, right? Um, and executive function, and we're going to do a little bit more on this next week, but in executive, we'd kind of do a little bit every week because um, it's it's a big part of what we're doing our every our next week in two weeks. Um, the most important, so it doesn't, when I'm talking about executive function, that can be a lot of different things, right? That can be inappropriate conversations, talking about stuff we shouldn't talk about. Um, it can be impulse control. It can be emotional dysregulation um any of those things the important thing in any of those that type of interpersonal inappropriateness or whatever um is to stay consistent just be very on it all the time um firm and direct not not bossy but definitely like it's a like it's okay to just be like that's not okay if you start, if you try to be a little more gentle away than the way you're saying it, like um, if you try to, oh, well, I was trying to be, you know, sensitive to your feelings or whatever. And so you're like subtle, um, that subtly might be something that they don't understand. That might be why I get along really well with people with brain injuries because I don't under, always understand subtly. Um, and I tend to talk very directly and it, it works very well. Um, you learn this in all kinds of job coaching things, um, but it's just especially important with people with brain injury. Be early, um, like prep not to do it or do it, reinforce not doing it or doing it, remind them how they didn't do it. Um, just the more that you can be aware of what could trigger any of these behaviors that we don't want to see, talk about it before it happens then that helps them not do or do the thing, reinforce the doing or the not doing, and then, you know, be, you know, upbeat and positive about it. Um, frequent breaks and sleep hygiene. 
So all of this frontal lobe stuff, right, um, is going to be affected by how tired you are. The ways to prevent being tired are to have good sleep hygiene, going to sleep at the same time every day, getting up at the same time, getting good night's rest, um, but also taking frequent breaks. Um, noting at what point in the in the day is maybe this person a little bit more lately, likelihood, is there a greater likelihood that this person is going to have an outburst or say something inappropriate? Because you might be able to stave that off just not by not having so much cognitive fatigue. Mm -hmm. So this isn't something that's like totally only happens to people with brain injury. Mm -hmm. I also get cranky when I haven't, um, I, I get cranky and my executive function does not work as well. And it is harder for me to do all of the things when I'm tired. Um, and I have to know when those things are happening and break off and kind of like stop doing stuff to re-energize myself, right? Um, there are a number of different visual scales that you can use. I think it depending on the person, um, I mean, and by visual scale, I mean anything from that they have like a bead on a pipe cleaner that's next to them so that you can like be, sh have them visually see, oh, like maybe we're getting a little hot or maybe our, you know, whatever. Th that might not make them feel, you know, that might not be great for the person. I, I'd be really super careful about when I use that, but even just like thumbs up, right? Um, thumbs up thumbs halfway, anything that makes it visual in addition to what you're telling them. Um, eye contact is magic. Um, it is, especially for people who have a low frustration tolerance or might be prone to getting upset. Um, if, if you can figure out how to have eye contact with that person, I had an individual when I was doing residential care um, who could get really upset uh, one time and or he got upset fairly often. And uh, one time he got upset and he was walking down the hall and I was like, hey, you know, just look at me for a second. And he wouldn't look at me as we were walking. And um, so I'm walking beside him and I could tell, I was saying, I just need you to look at me. And he wouldn't look at me. And finally I said, um, hey, you're not looking at me because you know the moment you look at me, you will calm down and you want to stay mad. And then he kind of broke after kind of a smile broke about it, or, uh, out on his face because he, you know, like I caught him. Um, and the funny thing about that particular situation was that guy had maybe like a 15 minute memory. He truly did not remember. I, I mean, an hour, he, an hour ago, he couldn't have told you what happened. Um, and after we had that conversation about the eye contact, um, then from then on, if he started to get upset, I would start to walk up next to him and he would not look at me and he'd go, you're too short to look at. And so because we have that emotional memory, we, we have connected on an emotional level about the fact that eye contact was something that was gonna calm him down. And that was something that could embed in his memory. Again, session one, we talked about how emotional memory is housed in the limbic system, whereas the things that you think of as memory are more on that, on the outside. And so it's not as, it, it's not as deep. It's more in your lobes and all around. Um, and when you can make that real emotional connection with somebody about something, um, that can help calm create that environment where they're going to stay calmer. Um, I also had somebody who had an impulse control problem that involved um, touching people's backsides, including mine, that he tried to. Um, and I, for that, I, it wasn't even a humorous thing. I looked at him. We had a really good mutual, uh, re, positive mutually reinforcing relationship. And I looked at him one day and I was like, you will never touch my butt again. And then he looked down and he said, I'm never doing that again. And he truly never did. Um, because when you have a strong emotional, uh, a strong positive professional, but like they, but mutually reinforcing relationship with somebody, those, that kind of emotional connection 
can help guide that behavior and help that person stay calm. And then you need to reinforce that and work on that from that standpoint so that they can do it when you're not around, right? Um, you, we can hold people accountable without blame. So somebody did reach out to me from this group and was saying, I'm confused. Like, I just want to make sure I'm doing the right thing because we've talked a lot about why things happen um, to people because of brain injury, what causes things to happen. And I think that was, that can be confusing because you're like, well, then if, if the brain injury is, if the brain injury is the reason that it happened, then it's maybe not their fault. Okay. So that's blame. Like if I'm going to say you got upset or you acted inappropriately and I, and I, and I place blame on that person, that's one thing. Holding people accountable and saying there are consequences to your actions. And if the consequence to your action is you get fired or you get written up or you get whatever, trying to protect people from the consequences of their actions, I feel like is not respectful of the person, right? So is it their fault that they get upset easily? No. Are they still accountable for what happens? Sure. Um, we were having, a, I was having a conversation with somebody before you guys all got on about how hard it is to keep weight off now that I'm older. Is it my fault that it's harder to keep weight off? Absolutely not. Like that was, that's just because I kept living. Um, do I have to live with the consequences of higher blood pressure or whatever things other than even just what I look like? Sure. Because I'm, a, I am accountable for my actions. There are natural consequences to everything that happens, whether or not we are to blame or not for those things, right? I wanted to bring up this book um, and by book, I mean, it's like a little tiny pamphlet um, and you can get it on this website that I put here again in the chat, you'll be able to see um, how to get to, oh shoot, I didn't mean to do that. Um, uh, you'll be able to see how to get to this presentation and there's a link to get to this. And it's like, I mean, it might be a 40 or 50 page little pamphlet and it's obviously got like 1970s style like graphics to it. It is not fancy, um, which is why you should not Google it and don't look at it on Amazon because for some reason, if you do that, it's $999. This is not a $1,000 pamphlet at all. Um, but this, LA Publishing Place has this helping exchange pearl, which was developed by Martin Mar McMorrow. McMorrow. Um, and it is a little thing that goes through kind of like, he worked in a brain injury, I believe it was inpatient hospital. Um, and he developed this idea about the he helping exchange and pearl. So the idea about Pearl is that you're positive early all reinforcing and look. Um, and we utilized this very extensively in the brain injury uh, residential behavioral health homes that I worked in. Um, it's all stuff that you know, because like most stuff in life that is like how to make things better, it is both easy and hard, like it's simple and hard. Um, uh, oh, the link in the chat. Yes, I can. Um, hold on. Let me do this. No, I can't. It's not letting me. Okay, so here we are. Here's the link. And I can copy it and put it because I've got it. I want to let me do this thing. Okay, we're going to do this and I'm going to put this in the chat um, while I'm continuing to talk. Um, so the way that the, the, what he does, um, I cannot get into the chat. Yes. By the end of this thing, I will put this in the chat. When Kim's talking, I will put it in the chat. Um, the, the whole program runs on the idea of positive, early, all reinforcing and look, um, they are, again, it's, it's not complicated, but it's not easy. So being positive is building that positive, mutually reinforcing relationship. And he gives examples in this pamphlet about how, you know, what that looks like. But it means that both the person served and the person who's providing the, um, the service 
are both getting something out of that relationship. Like the, it, like getting something out of it in the sense that it's positive. You can also have negatively mutually reinforcing relationships. If you're, ha if you're having struggles with a person in your personal life, right? And every time you get together, it's just, you're not good for each other. That's a negative mutually reinforcing relationship. The people in your life that when you, they make you better and you make them better. Those are positive mutually reinforcing relationships. And you can establish those in a professional environment as well. Early is like being aware of those antecedents. What is it that's gonna cause this person to get upset, right? Um, what is, like just making sure that you're aware, there's nothing more irritating when you're supervising staff than some one of the participants in your program blowing up and you come in and they had this blow up and they're like, yeah, we could see that coming. Okay, if you could see that coming, why did we not start addressing it before it got to this level, right? Um, so we wanna be able to be, early and get in out in front of it. Um, I was thinking about this all people all the time yesterday. Yesterday was a day, folks, man. Like yesterday was not Diane's day. And just one thing after another kept happening. And um, I ended the day because I needed to go see a person served who I see at their house. And it was smoking. and he was in a bad mood about some stuff and I it was really hard to be positive and reinforcing at that time and I'm like hey I had to tell myself man Diane step up man right now all means all all people all the time just because you are tired and hungry you know don't because you that's the other thing you got to do self-care you got to take care of yourself which I had not because I couldn't sleep the night before um uh, also I'd forgotten to eat um but you got to be good with all the people all the time. So that's a good thing. Um, hard, but true. Um, reinforcing. Um, this is evidence-based. So like the science, believe in the science, research shows that three positives for every corrective feedback can change the behavior all by itself. Um, I would say the more the positives and the more that you can ignore the negatives. And we all know this as parents, even when we had more parenting little kids um, and it's still hard. Um, I know I uh, had to work with my daughter. She would kind of, she could get, uh, she could get in some funks when she was a little one. Um, and I would start trying to help her feel better. And one day we just started calling her super happy and a problem solver. And I made a little pillow for her and it's a super happy and a problem solver. And she started seeing herself as a super happy person who was a problem solver and everybody's life got better. Um, so again, the more that you can try to catch people doing good and ignore people doing bad and then, re then redirect only when absolutely necessary, it's gonna be helpful. And you guys know this stuff and it is so hard to do. Um, and so look for opportunities to do all of the above. The reason I bring these book up and kind of like went through these concepts isn't because I think you guys don't know this. I think anybody who was aware of this webinar enough to show up um, and especially who was willing to dedicate the amount of time that you guys have dedicated to listening to me talk knows all these things. What I will tell you about this particular book and this particular approach is, especially if you're in a supervisory position and you're supervising frontline staff who need to be the ones who are doing this stuff, who are being early, who are taking care of all the people all the time, who are reinforcing those behaviors. What this approach does is it gives you a language to talk about it, right? So you can be like, are, were you being early? Were you taking care of all the people all the time? Was that reinforcing? Like if like when it's a it's a shorthand language for all that high end level behavioral fair behavioral like the CBT, the cognitive behavioral therapy, but mostly on the behavioral part. Any kind of thing that you want to do that's going to help people understand the behavioral approach to uh, dealing with people. This will give you like a shorthand language about how to break that all apart. Because we do that because my Angelo said um, that I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. A hundred percent true for all the people all the time. Um, however, it is especially true with people who have any kind of memory deficit. 
So a person with a short-term memory is not going to remember what you said. If somebody has short-term memory issues, they are going to forget what you did. They are not going to know what you did yesterday or the day before. Maybe they will. It depends on how long their memory will last, whatever. But I guarantee you they will never forget how you made them feel. And how you know this is because you experience this in your own life. There are people that you see that you can't remember how you know that person, but you 100% know whether or not you like them or not, even though you have no memory, or maybe you do, because maybe your memory is better than mine. I have a tendency to not know how I know somebody, but a lot of times I will know how that, like, I'll have a feeling about whether or not I like them or not. Well, I like most people. It very rarely happens that I don't like people, but, um, just keep that in mind. And if you, if you utilize those approaches, even when you're having a totally unhappy day, which was me yesterday, um, you got to make sure that you're remembering that the way that you're interacting with the rest of the world is going to help you help them feel better. Inappropriate comments. Um, we, we had this in another one. Uh, in a previous session, I think maybe last session, um, but it just, you can't say it enough. Uh, correct people without blaming. Hold people accountable for what they do um, because that's respectful. Um, but you gotta try to feel good about the people, all the people, all the time. Um, and it's okay to keep bringing things up matter of factly. I think sometimes when I'm working with folks, people will be shocked how often I will re remind people in a very matter of fact, non-blaming way about stuff that happened in the past. And I'm gonna get into that a little bit more in a slide down the road. Um, if I'm working with someone who has a short-term memory problem, sometimes, and I mean, you gotta know, I'm not saying like dig down on it, but I'm more likely to keep bringing up, oh, but remember how that happened because I'm their memory, right? Like I'm the one who remembers what went wrong in this job. They are not going to be the person who remembers what went wrong in this job. So you've got to be able to feel comfortable readdressing things that happened in the past in order to ingrain into it, you know, good things, bad things, all the things. But as long as you're like, hey, you know, totally cool that it happened, but also just remember that it happened and let's try to keep it from happening. Um, don't be hesitant to bring up stuff that happened previously. Uh, again, be direct. And then for things like things that we're not supposed to talk about, honestly, a list, a card, um, something that tells people what to say, and then, you know, be consistent. Um, as much as possible, anything that you don't want someone to do at work, again, they shouldn't do anywhere else at, at either, especially not like at home. Um, for things like building up frustration tolerance, um, a lot of times trying to job coach somebody at their job is going to be a little bit difficult because they may not get frustrated often enough. So this is, this is basically what happened with um, Bob Brain. His job was slow enough, like we purposely put him in a place where there, weren't gonna, there wasn't a lot of customer interaction. It's a, a, it's a slow moving job which meant that when I was trying to coach him through frustration tolerance and uh, shifting strategies and all these things that we were working on, we weren't having enough instances when he needed to do that thing that we were able to have a repetition rate, reinforcement rate. Like it, over a two hour period, maybe there'd be one thing that was mildly frustrating. That's not enough for me to be able to do a behavioral intervention. So I put some stuff up here. I showed set game. Um, in a previous class. Um, I'm not like not even opposed to Wordle. I think that there's some shifting in that. If that's something that they enjoy, plus then, you know, they can send you when they, if they get it or don't or whatever. Um, for you, those who have approached on the craze that is Wordle. Um, for Bob Brain, we also got an escape room to donate time. Uh, they donated two sessions and we went into an escape room and worked there. Um, which was really terribly helpful. Now, I'm not saying that the escape room in your town is going to do it. I think they only donated it to us once. I actually got a book um, about how to make escape rooms. Not that I'm going to make a whole escape room. That's crazy. But like I might do a couple of the different aspects of it. Um, 
because what I'm trying to do is job coach offsite with an activity that's going to frustrate the person so that I can get that repetition reinforcement. You got frustrated, we recovered. You got frustrated, we recovered. You got frustrated, we, we recovered. If it's a good job placement, you're not going to have the rate of repetition that you need to do that, right? Like if it's a good job placement, they're not going to get so frustrated so often that you're going to be able to do that quick recovery from it. And then when it does happen, you won't have enough practice because you've got to practice, right? So like when Bob Brain went to the occupational therapist and they had him put a desk together, that's because it's a frustrating activity. I also got one of these wonder looms and honest to God, as soon as I figure out how to do it enough so that I don't want to chuck the thing across the room, I will use that um, as a frustration. I don't know how like a fourth grade girl can put those stupid bracelets together because I'm telling you, I cannot do it. But as soon as I can and I understand how to make it work, then I'm going to take that frustrating piece of equipment and teach people and have people work on that and get frustrated. And again, they get frustrated we work on those. What do we do when we get frustrated? They get frustrated again. You work on what it is that we're going to do when we get frustrated. I also want to highly encourage you to develop a rehab, develop and see yourself as part of the rehab team. I work very closely with the occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech therapy. Um, we don't have, not here. I just happen to have an especially good relationship with On With Life. So a lot of times I will touch base with them. Um, I can, um, uh, yes, Carrie, when I'm doing offsite job coaching, um, it is not part of their paid employment time. Um, I, I've been able to be in a situation where we, we just considered that offsite job coaching. It was offsite job coaching. They weren't getting paid for that time. It was just part of like the offsite sessions, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, and everybody was open to the idea, both uh, VR, who was the funder in that situation, um, and also the person for, because they realized that they needed this help, not just for work, but just for life, right? Um, okay, so back to working with the occupational therapy and speech therapy and um, those teams. Twice within the last time that I've seen you guys, I have worked specifically with a speech therapist on something. One was for Bob Brain. Um, I was trying to figure out if some of the things that he was experiencing um, was a different executive function problem, um, and I was struggling, and um, he had signed releases, and I was able to talk to speech therapy, um, and we were able to say that, um, and then speech therapy went to physical therapy, like we all know each other, right, um, and they came back and said, we really think it's anxiety, like you've got to address that underlying anxiety, um, and the other time that I met with speech therapy within this last, since we saw each other, um, I have a, a gentleman that I'm serving that has really significant aphasia, um, and I needed to see how far I could push him to try to speak, um, and so went to a speech therapy session, and I was able to tell that he is, um, I was able to be able to tell that he is in speech therapy trying to put together three sentence blocks, so like, throw the ball, that kind of thing. Um, and so that gives me a little bit more information about when I, we're gonna go into a work readiness assessment pretty soon. And now I know how far I can push him to try to speak because I watched the speech therapy. What I'm really trying to tell you guys right now is that you are an important part of that therapy team. When you are talking to the occupational and the physical therapy and the speech therapy, I just, I get the feeling a lot of times that people in the employment world would be like, oh, that's medical model. They're like the medical professionals. You are a vital part of this person's rehabilitation process. You are consulting with your fellow people and you all are coming in with a different area of expertise and see yourself as an equal in that relationship because what they're doing in house in their offices with the occupational physical and speech therapy you're then taking out and trying to make that work in the real world the the therapists are super grateful that you're utilizing their information to make the real world work happen and more than likely they're going to be more than willing to talk with you and consult on how to help the person served 
Um, last week, Joan talked about the brain injuries, neural resource facilitation. I just am bringing it back up again because that is also can be a very important part of your team. These guys know so much about so many things. And if the person served, um, you can call. Well, also, another thing I did this week um, was meeting with somebody together. We called the Brain Injury Alliance. We got them some neuro resource facilitation. They signed some releases um, just to make sure that we're connecting with everybody with all the resources that are available to them. And then I am going to stop sharing my screen and let one of my very, very important, awesome, awesome partners speak. And so Kimberly Chance um, from Easter Seals is going to talk to you guys today a little bit about what services they offer here in the Des Moines area and what a great partner they have always been to me. So go Kim. Thanks so much, Diane. And thank you all so much for letting me hop on here. I see some familiar names and some unfamiliar names. So hopefully some of you will get to learn something new about Easter Seals and some of you will get to learn about Easter Seals for the first time. So I am actually headed into my 10th year working for the Easter Seals Iowa Assistive Technology Program and the Rural Solutions Program. I'm gonna share my screen and utilize our website to help guide my conversation with you today so that hopefully if something strikes your attention, you know exactly where to go to get that information, um, how to get your hands around it, and then certainly how to find information to contact us. So this is our website, iowaat.org. Pretty easy that we're the assistive technology program. We are the state implementing entity for the Tech Act here in Iowa, meaning we provide a variety of services to help Iowans learn about, trial, demonstrate, and get their hands on to obtain assistive technology. When I say assistive technology, I'm really referring to any device, any service, any intervention that helps an individual with a disability accomplish a task that without that said service, they would be unable to accomplish. And as I said that several pictures rolled through. So you were able to see a few examples such as communication devices, gardening tools, um, adaptations to your environment, such as typing aids, a, a variety of tools that really help individuals be able to accomplish tasks every single day. When it comes to individuals who have brain injury, we can sometimes overlook what an important piece of their day might be supported with a piece of assistive technology because we may take it for granted that it's pretty simple stuff for us to know and utilize every day. And one of those is scheduling and organization. And it's really a, a key tool to making sure that we all get to where we're headed in a day. And it's really important that we consider that when we're working with individuals with brain injuries. So to help you with your organization of how to host the conversation, I'm going to direct you to another little page here. So on our website, underneath selecting and obtaining devices, there's a little area called how to select a device. And under here, we put together some steps to success for selecting assistive technology. The first step is defining your goal. We would be nowhere unless we made a decision as to where we're headed. Um, and that's gonna be really true when it comes to job coaching, as Diane said, sometimes you have to put prompts in the environment that really help you identify your goal of being overstimulated or frustrated with a task. So if you're looking at figuring out what those different goals are for a specific individual, it can vary. Many individuals will say to me, well, you know, I'm working with somebody who has low vision. What devices do you have to help? And I have to say, well, what's your goal? What room do you want to start with? What task do you want to, do you want to figure out first? Because just saying a, a diagnosis or a symptom is too broad. It's, it's, not the individualized specific need that I'm going to need to know about in order to help support you through the process. So we want to identify the goal. So really, what is that specific task? And then who is it that's trying to accomplish that task? And what nuances are involved in that situation? How has it been done in the past? What's worked? What hasn't worked? Where are we headed with that? And all of those questions are not things that you have to trouble yourself with figuring out. You can just call us or email us or any, any of the above, we can Zoom even to just have a conversation about really narrowing in on that goal. Once you really know the goal, that's when you look to determine that team. 
oftentimes I work with occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech language pathologists. I also work with job coaches and am part of that team myself sometimes to help kind of navigate the conversation. Then the step three, this is really the single most important step in the whole process is that consultation with the end user. So I know there's a few videos up, but even if you just want to use a raise a hand or not participate at all, that's fine. I have a quick question. Um, how many of you are using your very first smartphone that you ever purchased or ever received forever? You're still on your very, very mm -hmm. first smartphone. And I'm going to make an assumption since mm -hmm. I don't see any hands up that none of you are because it do probably doesn't even work anymore. It was probably a little flip phone that you had many years ago and really has no purpose now because it's not what you need. If somebody had never consulted with you as to what you need and just asked, oh, so you need a cell phone and handed you that very first flip phone that you ever owned, it would not serve very much of a purpose. And that's why that consultation with the end user is incredibly important because we have to know really how this piece of technology or how this device or this service Assistive technology can even be a support person involved in a situation. We have to know how that individual who's going to be utilizing that service is going to be impacted by it. So it's very important that we consult with the end user and that they have their hands on the whole conversation. And step four is the access to the environment. And this is also very important as one device may work wonderfully in the office, and then all of a sudden a global pandemic hits and everybody's <laughs> set to work virtually. And all of a sudden they don't have the same supports. We had so many calls at the beginning of 2020 to help individuals with ergonomic workspaces in their home, even the individuals that maybe didn't have a diagnosed disability, but really they found their environment changed. The tools that they had available to them changed and they were finding it very difficult to still perform those tasks that were required of them with what tools they had at their fingertips. And then step five is trial the technology. And I'll go back to that cell phone example. Very rarely do we decide what cell phone we want without knowing features and functions about the device. And oftentimes, if you're like me, you want to go in and play with devices before you decide that this is gonna be the cell phone that you're gonna use. For me, it's the camera feature that sells a phone. And I want to go in and I wanna play around with that camera feature on a real life cell phone before I decide on the make, the model and the version of phone that I wanna use for the next however many years it will be. Trialing the technology is incredibly important. And that's why we have our lending library available at Easter Seals so that individuals can have a chance to try out and really decide what's not gonna work in their environment. So at the very top of our webpage, we have a virtual tour that gives you just an experience in our assistive technology center. So as you navigate through this virtual tour, it'll give you a taste of a little bit more of what is assistive technology, where can you find it? So assistive technology can be this adaptive cupboard um, that allows access to all the space from a seated position. Or I'm gonna hop back over here since I was just talking about these examples. Or it could be computer and, a, and related devices. So over in this section, you'll see we have a variety of tubs. Each of these tubs is here full of different devices. Not all of our devices are linked into our live tour, um, but some of them are. So I want to give the example of trialing the device. Um, occasionally individuals who experience a traumatic brain injury may experience um, left and right side unbalanced, meaning that they might have one hand that becomes more dominant than the other hand, even if it wasn't their most dominant hand prior to that diagnosis. And very oftentimes I have people reach out to me and say, I really, really think that I need a one-handed keyboard. They're really cool devices, but they require a whole new learning curve. So if somebody decides on a, on a one-handed keyboard. And when I click on that virtual tour, it's actually going to redirect me to our AT for all site. So we can see just a little bit more information about this keyboard. They may say, you know, the one hand keyboard, that's the answer. That's what I need. And if I scroll all the way to the bottom, you can see that the cost for a one hand keyboard is $695. That is a very, very expensive keyboard. So if someone was to just purchase this keyboard off Amazon, have it arrive at their house and then try it out for the very first time, they could have potentially wasted $700 in that, in that situation. And honestly, that could be rent and groceries for somebody in a month. 
So making sure that they have access to our lending library so that they can try out a device like this. Um, in my experience, individuals rarely end up deciding that this one-handed keyboard is really the answer to them because the keys are very different than the QWERTY layout or even an alphabetical layout. So individuals have to go back to square one and relearn typing from the very beginning. Whereas if they wanted to try something like a small USB keyboard, we also have an option like that. And then we can help coach them through strategies of learning how to type from a one-handed perspective or a one-handed perspective with the support of external devices like um, dictation. So they're using uh, Dragon dictation or another dictation device to speak what they're trying to type or navigation for the computer that utilizes their head or another type of mouse. So we have a huge variety of devices that individuals can trial for a free 30 day period so that they can rule out the devices that don't work for them before they identify the device that will work for them long term. Now, when it comes to assistive technology, they may find that resolving one barrier opens the doors to a whole other avenue of barriers because they just took an additional step forward in life. And that's okay. It's okay to have the answer to one problem lead to several other problems because it means we're moving forward and it means that we're figuring out what those next steps are instead of remaining stagnant and having somebody just reside within the status quo. We all know that every single day we face challenges that are different than the day before. And if somebody doesn't, it means that they're having some type of limitation that we need to make sure we're breaking down those barriers for them to truly experience life. So assistive technology is one of those avenues that you can even use it to, like, you know, Diane was an example of using it as a possible tool to frustrate somebody in a situation. I would throw that left-handed keyboard at anybody to frustrate <laughs> them in a situation, have them type their name. <laughs> But you can also use it as a tool to help somebody explore new hobbies, explore new interests, find a new passion that maybe they didn't already have. We have gardening tools and fishing adaptations to help somebody explore these passions. We even have recreation, sports and leisure stuff, including camping um, items, tents, things like that. So individuals might have an opportunity to step into a realm that they're unfamiliar which sometimes can be frustrating, but it could also be an opportunity to build rapport with somebody that maybe you're having a hard time leading a conversation on or they're getting frustrated because you don't have interests that unite, but figuring out what are new interests that the two of you can look at together to build that rapport and move forward. Now I'm going to just stop talking because I could definitely talk for the next 10 minutes and just see if there are any questions at this point. So Stephanie asked, um, are these services generally covered by Medicare and Medicaid waiver? So um, are you asking the services that we provide? So our lending library is free of charge for individuals across the state of Iowa. They, you don't need a diagnosis or anything in order to access our lending library. You yourself, Stephanie, could hop on this AT for All website, which is eastersealsia.at, the number four, A-L-L, atforall.com and request a loan for that fish winch 65. We would then reach out to you to see if you're interested in any other comparables. Very oftentimes, if it's a, if it's a new name, we want to get to know you, talk to you about some additional um, questions that we might have about you and what situation you're using it in, just to make sure that we don't have other creative ideas on tools to use or to compare it to as you borrow it. So you might say, hey, do you want that pole lock fishing rod holder too? Um, do you want to talk about ice fishing resources in the state of Iowa that we can help you get set up with? I'm going to tell you what. Kim, I'm, be ice I'm guessing fishing. that her question is kind of like once if they just like so that she could, I don't, I, I should probably didn't understand that the lending of it is free. But then if you decided that you needed that as an assistive technology for your job, then you could go back to the funding source and show and prove that it had worked before they were investing in that. In yeah, that I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to the, the purchasing part in just okay. a minute. So we can help you find those, those resources to, to really figure it out. So then after that loan period, if it's something you want to borrow, something like a fish winch 65 is not something that would typically be covered by waiver services. But if you're an individual that has a diagnosed brain injury and you're looking for these resources, we can help guide you, but it's gonna be very dependent upon the individual. Sometimes it depends on their age range, the county that they reside, and really what, what device they're looking for. 
If you're looking for um, a device like a keyboard, again, rarely are they covered by Medicare, Medicaid, or waiver services, but there are other avenues, other funding resources that are available. So we, we want to start that conversation early with people as well as to really what, what resources do you have connection with? How can we identify the steps to success? Um, with these fishing pole holders, very oftentimes, same with a lot of devices, what we have may not be the actual end all solution, perfect device. What we might need to look at is who else can we partner with to make sure that this individual can get their hands on the device that's really gonna work best long-term. We have another program that is our durable medical equipment loan program. And through that program, we loan out shower benches, wheelchairs, walkers, uh, hospital beds, all sorts of things. Now this program operates through donation of durable medical equipment. So we're not able to utilize Medicare, um, Medicaid or waiver dollars for these devices. They're typically um, private pay or somebody paying out of pocket, but because it's recycled equipment, there, it is um, a very nominal fee that individuals would have to pay. And that would be a one-time fee to use the device as long as they need it. So if an individual um, needs to access a manual wheelchair, perhaps when they went through the insurance coverage, insurance identified that a cane would be the most appropriate device for them, but they find themselves really needing to rely on a manual wheelchair for longer distances. They can contact us and a manual wheelchair would be a one-time fee of $75 and that individual can use it as long as they need it. Meaning we're not gonna follow up and say, hey, this has to come back to us. It's really an open-ended loan for an individual to use it. Um, oh, so I hope that answered your question. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I utilized, I remember utilizing the durable equipment program one time when I had a guy who kept throwing his, his walker across the room. Um, and so we kept needing to get new walkers and it, utilizing that program tended to be the best way to get new walkers on a fairly consistent basis. So it is very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And so through our webpage, which I'll put it in the chat window in just a second, there's even a contact us form as well as a link to our um, newsletter or it's an electronic newsletter through MailChimp so that you can be updated on any new devices that we have or events and opportunities. We, uh, four times a year, we have an open to the public Zoom meeting where you can learn about different events and, and really cool stuff right now. And I'm gonna say it to this group because I think it's a group that's probably gonna wanna remember us and keep checking in on it. We are heading into a really new adventure that may allow us to be able to provide um, supports and services for individuals with disabilities to get into gaming or adaptive gaming. Um, and when I say that, I'm referring to like video games, which I know very little about, but luckily I have a team member that knows a lot more and is really spearheading this initiative. So I encourage you to get on our MailChimp use newsletter so that you don't miss anything about what's coming up in the future. I'll be hanging out for, for the next few minutes. So if you have any questions for me, put them in the chat window and then I'll also drop my um, email in the chat window as well. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Um, so that is one of my va very valued partners. So that's what I'm saying, like you utilize your partners, you utilize the Brain Injury Alliance, you utilize folks that you have in your area that can help you um, manage through all this stuff. So we've got a couple more minutes. Um, I was gonna talk a little bit about mindfulness because I did mention at some point that I was a yoga instructor. Um, there are a couple of different things when you're working with executive function and trying to pe get people to uh, practice mindfulness, um, practice things. Love Your Brain um, is a yoga program that was developed specifically for by somebody with a brain injury. He actually was a snowboarder who was uh, like basically frenemies with Sean White. He got a very bad brain injury. His family um, developed this Love Your Brain yoga. They used to do a lot more like with local uh, yoga studios. Um, and they were, it was getting to the point where it was pretty easy to find a Love Your Brain program in your area. You did have to be able to manage your emotions and you could, you had to be fully mobile. Like they didn't take people in wheelchairs and stuff. Um, but that's gotten, because of the pandemic, that kind of went to the side, but they do have like online videos. Um, if people were interested in that, also to, to if uh, someone do, it does have family members that can help them or they're interested, 
in some other kind of like ways to do yoga and like I'm mainly talking about trying to d develop techniques for handling executive function. Um, sometimes having something that you're doing that's kind of mindfulness keeps you slowed down um, and yoga can do that. There's also this book that you can get on um, this. You do go to Amazon. Other one, do not go to Amazon. It's very expensive on Amazon. This one um, was developed by a yoga instructor whose dad got a brain injury and she developed this book called M M Move, Feel, Think. Um, that really kind of walks people through, especially that a family member they could be doing something with. Um, it's a good way to have an activity for folks. Um, also mentioned the last time, we do have a soft skill assessment that we send out uh, to employers and to the person to see how we're doing with those executive skills in the work environment. Um, also want to encourage people to do mental health therapy, um, constantly encouraging people to have natural supports. Another program, I mentioned this before, the pandemic has been terrible for all people, but especially people with brain injury, because this interaction that you're seeing here between this man and this woman, that's one of the things that really supports our brain health is having those positive interactions with people. Um, the fact that we've been able to do less of this, be this close together and talk to each other, um, has not been good for any anyone, including the people with the brain injuries. So trying to help people nurture and develop those natural supports, really thinking about it from a holistic area. Um, with Bob the Brain, Bob Brainy, um, we're uh, having part of his mental health therapy and part of what we're working on is helping him develop good, positive coping mechanisms. Uh, you can tell from this picture what one of his current coping mechanisms is, is, and he has a medical marijuana prescription. But one of the things that we were noticing was that in his off time, um, he was going to that vape pen whenever he got frustrated. And we had to start having some conversations about if when you're off, when you're if when you're away from work, you are using the vape pen when you're frustrated or irritated, you're gonna want to do it when you're at work too. And if you do, and if you can't do it at work, in other words, like I'm frustrated, my go-to when I get frustrated is to vape. And right now I'm frustrated and I can't get to a vape pen because I'm at work and they don't let me do it at work. Um, you're just going to get more and more frustrated. So trying to make sure that we're mitigating, you know, in the positive. And again, this is an area where having people, um, having that other um, things, uh, works well. Um, so I am, we're getting to the end and we got Nora Half Party says Facebook yoga for working with brain injuries group that you manage. I will definitely have to work, look into that. I have, wasn't aware of that. Um, so I am going to write that down. Um, and I just wanted to see before we close up, Next week is our last week. And then of course we've got the um we've got the, the group that you guys should get so excited about, about listening to people um who have lived experience talking. So I'm gonna just flip through just another again. We'll talk about um jobs changing next week. Yes, the next session is February 17th from 3:30 to 4:30. Um, and we've got all the links, the recordings, and um, yes, I look forward to next week. And we'll have even more discussions um, along the lines of the way we ended it today. Everybody have a wonderful evening, and I'll talk to you later.